Listen up. Listen. The number one question as we're talking about direct to consumer is it UPSable? There's a certain girth dimension and a weight. Right from the starting block, our engineering team, our design team knows exactly where to set those parameters, how to form it, make sure that it's robust while not exceeding that weight limit requirement. Listen. 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 Ready to talk logistics? But how? It can't be done. Listen. We should probably figure out some logistics. Welcome to another episode of Supply Chain Therapy. I am your host, Alex Kent, joined by my co-host, Michelle McNamara. Michelle, what's going on? What's up, Alex? How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Awesome. Uh, we have a great episode for you today. Our guest, Tom Newman, Supply Chain and Procurement Manager at Blackstone Products. Tom has a decorated career in moving big things. Before his griddle life, he was the director of supply chain planning and execution at iFit, which is a fitness app that operates in tandem with its own workout equipment. He's also held roles at Campbell Scientific, a manufacturer of full-scale data measurement systems and Orbit, best known for their irrigation solutions. Fun fact, Tom learned Mandarin during his early college years living in Taiwan and Beijing. We'll talk more about that in this episode. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Alex. Uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to span the entirety of the United States all together. <laughs> you on one coast, Alex on the other, and I'm somewhere in the middle of the flyover zone. <laughs> That's right. Tell us where you are. I see you're, okay. you're wearing some cold right. weather gear. Right. Very, very practical today. Um, <laughs> Logan, Utah, which is not out of the throes of winter yet, and in fact just snowed this morning and literally oh the, the, the piles next to my driveway are, are at my, like this level. So this hat actually has multi-purpose. Number one, <laughs> it's got an avalanche beacon in it so I can be found in case I'm lost. Number two, it's keeping my head warm because, you know, I don't have, I, I'm clean on top, so I need protection. And number three, my colleagues tell me that my spirit animal is a garden gnome, so it fits. <laughs> a garden gnome. <laughs> yes, right. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, this is supply chain therapy after all, so we can't get too much further without a collective mm. deep breath. Ready? We inhale and we exhale. Oh, so relaxed. Um, but nice. after that nice, relaxing breath, let's get into the juice, the drama. Do you have any fun challenges that you've experienced in your history that you care to share? Yeah, I, I wanted to tell you guys, I wanted to share with you all the, the story of the errant ferrite. Okay, so a ferrite, actually it's also called an EMI choke or electromagnetic interference choke. It looks like a little, uh, like a little metal donut. And so... This is my traumatic experience that I had. Early in the days, I was engineering uh, development manager for Motorola Energy Systems Group, uh, which I think doesn't exist anymore, but it was based in Lawrenceville, Georgia, Alex, just up the street okay. from where you are. Um, and we were tasked with basically reverse engineering a product that the company that was building it had gone out of business. And so it was a desk set for... Um, cell phone. So you could take your cell phone and basically plug it in, mount it in this desk set, and then have it like a, like a phone on your desk. Really great idea. So I had, you know, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers doing all the layouts and the, and the traces and the, and the Gerbers and the, and, and everything. Also including the software, all the, all the way through to initial testing passed great. And then we started some small scale production and then sent some, test units to Lawrenceville for testing. And they did what's called accelerated life test, which does temperature cycling. And what it, what happened was it became a box of rattles and that ferrite, which oh, no. attached to the, the power cord that comes in and is usually required because these electronic products have to go through FCC testing for electromagnetic interference testing. Um, anyway, that ferrite, uh, came loose from the from the adhesive that we had been using, and it was like we spec'd every single part all the way down to what I thought was the most minute detail, except for the adhesive that was holding that ferrite. So lessons learned: 
I, I don't ignore anything on the bill of materials. I look all the way through, all the way to the very end, even the smallest, you know, whatever it is, including something like adhesive, because we had to, basically we had to cut production and, and we had, uh, we had some yield problems with everything we'd produced up to that point. We got it right. But since that point, my, my mantra has been, you know, just pay attention to the details. How much rework is involved in something like that? I'm trying to remember how many units we had produced. And I think, I think it was a matter of being able to open it up, remove the adhesive, reapply adhesive, um, make sure that the ferrite, as it was banging around in there, didn't knock loose any of the surface mounted components. But yeah, there was, as long as you can catch it early before it goes out to the end consumer, which, which we were able to do. But yeah, those, those things can happen. And you just, had we not gone through that temperature cycling of, of, you know, hot, cold, hot, cold, we never would have caught it. So that's another thing. I mean, just don't cut short on the testing that needs to be done to make sure a product meets all the specs. Yeah. And I think all the supply chain folks listening right now are nodding along. Like they probably had a very <laughs> similar experience and anyone not yeah. in supply chain, they think, Oh, like what's a small little change? What that, what's that going to do? But really it's a huge, a huge challenge. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm sorry you went through that, but I'm glad that you're here today. <laughs> you survived. Thank you. Yeah, I survived. Um, yes. Cool. But didn't kill Let's... me, made me stronger. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Love it. Let's <laughs> switch over to your current company, Blackstone Products. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. Why don't you, for the listeners at home that haven't heard of it, maybe they live under a rock, haven't seen the TikTok, because <laughs> it's got a big TikTok presence. Uh, what does Blackstone Products do? So Blackstone Products was actually started in about 2008 by our founder and current CEO, Roger Dolly. And his, his disruption uh, mentality was, let's introduce variety and accessibility to outdoor cooking. And so just think of breakfast. Think of, you know, it's a participation sport. Griddling, you put two spatulas in your hands and you become Mr. Teppanyaki guy, right? You can <laughs> throw stuff around. It brings families together and friends together and it, and it introduces food variety. So yeah, you think of, you know, eggs and, and small stuff that would otherwise be falling through the grill plates and, you know, the black science of a pellet stove, you know, you put it in there and you close it for three hours and then you come back and you hope something turns out. You mentioned, you mentioned TikTok, a great venue for the kind of cooking dynamic that our product affords, right? You can be there and in, you know, a few short minutes, you can have, you can have that nice crust on the steak. You can sear and, and have, you know, veggies going on one side and the main course meat on the other side, buns down the middle. It's great. It's, it's a lot of fun. And so since that time, it's been the biggest growing section of the outdoor cooking market. Michelle, you didn't tell me I was going to get hungry already. Um, I, I told myself I would eat before. I did not. <laughs> you, so you miss Tommy. You miss one thing though. It's, yeah, it's what? bacon, bacon, eggs, sausage, maybe a little bit of chorizo, and the um, hash browns. You got to have yes, the hash browns. Yes, and all of that is in your, you know, your your playing field of the griddle that has sides. Nothing goes errant. Nothing goes awry, and it's all there. And you can keep. Finish stuff and move it over and keep it warm and take a yeah, little chef snack every now and then. Oh, yeah. Toss you some gotta, to the you dogs, sample. you know. Yep. Of course. Yep. And then the audience that's standing around you, hey, here you go. Catch the <laughs> <laughs> little, little catch volcano the if you need to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 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 That's right. Exactly. And what we've just launched is, is our, is our pizza oven. And I think it's right, it's right here. If you can see it for those who are watching at home, um, uh, a, a great pizza oven. We just launched it. I just put one these bad boys together at my house and it's like i've never looked back it's wonderful all right so anyone that is worth their salt in supply chain knows tom are you crazy why are you shipping griddles how <laughs> yes. are you doing yes. d2c it's so heavy yes so can you talk us through what that looks like good question we have our we know our thresholds and the the number one question if as we're talking about direct to consumer which is the fastest segment of our of our total channel uh, to customer is, is it UPSable? Will it UPS, right? <laughs> and so there's, there's a certain girth dimension and a weight of 150 pounds. We try to keep it as well under that as possible, but 
Yeah, that's those are their criteria. So right from right from the starting block, our engineering team, our design team knows exactly where to where to set those parameters, the thickness of the metal, how to bend it, how to how to form it, the 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 the, the critical points that need to be intact to to make sure that it's robust while not exceeding that that packaging that weight limit requirement. And then, you know, you talk about packaging uh, how to fit it all together with the as minimal amount of packaging as possible, but still to keep the package size small and the overall weight down. So yeah, it's, that's a challenge. Especially so an average Joe like me can figure out how to put it together, right? I mean, you, yes. you got to have all the pieces there and it, that's exactly. part of it, right? That's part of the fun exactly. of putting together a new grill or a griddle or a pizza oven is having that excitement, that unboxing experience saying, oh yeah, I'm going to put this together and we're going to cook some food. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that that hastens the anticipation, knowing that there's a good meal at the end of it, putting it all together. Yeah. And so will you ever ship it with more than one box or is 150 pounds the max? Perfect question. So this pizza oven, this pizza oven is actually Tetris into a somewhat larger box. And we've found as we've launched it that we are facing challenges. There's weaknesses in the packaging. And so to meet a couple of these criteria, and I'll throw in one more, which is the punitive tariffs that are imposed on products that come from China. We have to make sure that the overall kit, if you will, so if you've got box one of two and two of two, that they come together and they qualify for the same overall weight restriction, and then we can divide it out. Then you say, okay, what's the logical weight division between these two packages. And what we found is that not only can we divide it into two packages, but if we take, okay, we've got the top element of the pizza oven, it now becomes a tabletop item that box one of two is actually one of one, and it just became a whole new skew unto itself. So those are some of the, you know, the un, the unanticipated benefits that come out of that kind of dynamic of, of analyzing how to get, how to ship stuff more efficiently. Now, are you doing different packaging for the things that you know are UPSable versus the things that you know are going maybe directly to a retailer? Are you is yeah. it different packaging, different SKUs? Because you can pack a lot more into a container that way for someone going to a retailer than a you know a container that's coming to your warehouse to go D to C. Exactly, and not only that, um, the cost difference between four color lithography versus craft packaging makes a huge difference too. Yeah. So, direct to consumer can go in in craft packaging. It can be a little bit thicker. It can be a little bit more robust, if you will, knowing that it's retail that it's going to be in a container, you know, soup to nuts all the way through. That it'll be more protected and 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 cared for along the way. Yeah, we we do make some trade offs there, but we also have thresholds in our product line where we say, hey, you know, this size griddle, it's not going to be a D to C. It's going to be a it's going to be through the retail channel. And Makes then sense. yeah, we develop two 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 separate paths that way as well. This is a great segue into B two B because you guys have a really unique way that you do a lot of your B two B. Can you can you speak to that? Right. So you, you pointed out, I mean, our products are big. And so the idea of shipping them from Yentian or Shaman or Shanghai, whatever port in China to LA, then training it up to Salt Lake, then to, to Logan, and then on from there, that's not efficient. So we've, we've developed direct import programs with our largest customers, Walmart, Lowe's, uh, uh, Ace Hardware, where we basically sell it FOB, free on board, port of China. And, and that's really, that's about 80% of our business goes direct import. Now, the challenge there is each retailer has their own third party logistics partner that they work with. They have their own unique pre shipment inspections, pre, you know, product testing requirements, because, you know, the visibility for somebody like, like a Walmart, who's in, who's the importer of record from China, they have to maintain certain certain expectations and, and, and decorum of the factories that they source from. So there's a lot more, uh, I wouldn't say a lot more, but it's different in terms of certifications and validations and inspections. And we have to get all of that tied up before we can launch that first container going directly to them. 
but that's that's most of our that's most of our business and it and it works well for both of us gets it to them more directly they can actually see it from the time it leaves the port they know exactly where it is in their system rather than wondering okay where along the way do you have it blackstone products right so lots of benefits to that would you say it's more of a headache to do the b2b side or the direct to consumer side that's a great question and i think because it's We've developed that direct import uh, methodology. We have a great team that works with me that manages. They each have their own uh, dear dear customers that they work with. They've got that pretty well nailed down. Now, direct to consumer, it's always that challenge of okay, how do we how do we make it shippable that way? But the advantage with uh, direct to consumer is bundling. I mean, the idea of being able to say, just have somebody get online and say, oh, I'll take the griddle, I'll take that starter kit, I'll take those tools, I'll take that accessories. And the attachment rate for D2C is really, really good for us. So it, you know, there's challenges, but it pays off. And like I said, D2C is our, is our fastest growing segment of our two consumer channels. Yeah. So if there was another business out there considering direct import, what would you say are the pros and cons? Like maybe walk them through uh, the process of, of how right. they would decide. Right. And I've got uh, one of my great team members who probably could do some supply chain therapy because she goes through it all the time. <laughs> oh, it's, no. that, it's that it's it's asking the questions that sometimes those retailers don't even know that they don't know. Like, mm-hmm. huh. OK, who's your third party logistics provider? What are their expectations in terms of uh, how the bookings are done? You know, how to create the documentation, the timetables, which need to be very tight from the point that it leaves the factory to the port, to getting on the ship, to sending it off. Now, and, and, and lead times now are, are coming way down in terms of ship space and, and container space availability. So it's become a lot easier to say, okay, I need a booking. I can pretty well pick that time and do it. But compared to I two mean, years ago, <laughs> exactly. Or even, or even, or even six months ago. I mean, right. I, we've watched dramatic declines in, in freight rates and availability of space, but it's like, you know, if I were to say, okay, here's a questionnaire. Here's 20 questions of, you know, all the things that you need to think about to set up a direct import program. And as we've done that, lessons learned, those customers that have gone through that, a lot more upfront prevention of later on, oh, shoots, I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have mm-hmm. done that. So, yeah, those are the pros and cons. But, you know, to have somebody who's thought about it and been through it on some other programs to say, well, here's some lessons learned. Here's the best way. Here's a benchmark, best practices of how to do it. Awesome. All right, let's move on to manufacturing. So man- manufacturing is very critical to Blackstone products, and you guys take a very thoughtful approach to your manufacturing process. Let's start there. T- tell us about your process, and, and you've really focused on that in the past few years. So, so what's new in the past couple of years? Our model is ODM. We work with factory partners that come to the table with certain capabilities. It's not an off-the-shelf mm-hmm. design. There's things that we add to the mix. There's things that the factory presents and brings into the mix and such that we collaborate and we develop together. Now, for a sourcing guy, that makes it a little bit difficult because what you've now done is you've almost captivated yourself to say, I'm locked into this factory because they have helped co-develop this this product. But over the past year and a half, our engineering team has done a great job of standardizing designs such that we now have SKUs that we can go to any number of our current factory portfolio and source it. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to put together the same way. It's going to, it's going to have service parts that are the exactly interchangeable. But yeah, that's, those are the keys. So, so uh, the things that we think about is, you know, what does the factory bring to the table? And for us, it's, do they know how to process metal? Do they know how to source metal? Um, do they know how to bend it and shape it and cut it, whether it's stamping or lasering? And then how to weld it together in the, in the right way. And then surface treatment is so critical because our products, they're, you know, they're put on the backyard. They're put in the back patio and they're exposed to the weather. And so you've got to have years and years of, of corrosion prevention to have, you know, to be able to say, you know, you come out and fire it up in the spring and it looks just as good as it did when you bought it. So those are all things that we make sure that the factory brings to the table are all those technologies and those knowledge bases. What we, what we focus on, what our secret sauce is, 
Okay, heat flow, thermodynamics. How does the heat transfer on that griddle plate, right? How to, how to make the orifice size on the gas rail to get the right BTU to heat ratio. So the energy that the, the propane consumption is as efficient as possible while still allowing, you know, two, three, four heating zones, cooking zones. And so that's what we bring to the table. And so through that partnership, we've been able to go from what was Probably two, two, three years ago, we had two main manufacturers. We've now more than doubled that. And we've also got diversity in terms of a diversification in terms of geography. You know, the mm. concern about the mentality about China and, you know, putting all our eggs in the China basket. We now have a factory in Cambodia that we've ramped up on. We've got a factory in northern Vietnam that's going to be producing and shipping for us. So we have those options that keep that keep that keep us flexible on the table depending on what we need and 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 what the how the how the import winds blow and the political winds blow sure and so um how do you pressure test quality check how do you test these new manufacturers were you able to visit the facilities or what do <laughs> yeah, you do yes 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 so so the the one trip that i have taken in like almost 4 years uh, was to, that. <laughs> yeah, was to Northern <laughs> Vietnam to visit this, okay. uh, this, uh, this factory up. And, um, you, you know, in terms of handing to them specifications that they need to maintain, you know, it's certain metal, uh, constituencies and, and ingredients. Uh, so we're, we're making sure of that when we, when they send us samples, we test that. We test how those, uh, the surface treatment, how it's prepared and cleaned, and then how it's treated afterward because we condition those griddle plates much as you would when you're buying a, 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 a cast iron stove, for example, or cast iron uh, pot. Um, you know, they're, they're conditioned the same way. So we have to make sure, okay, what, what vegetable oil are you using? What, 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 what's the ingredients in that? To make sure that we get the right seasoning on that on that surface, because it's going to be in contact with the food, and and that's really critical to performance. And then you know we've got a whole a whole um, R and D lab that does all kinds of tearing apart and cross sectioning and chemical testing and 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 lots of life testing, which means they've got to cook a lot of stuff. So because my <laughs> office is right next to the test lab, I benefit from that too. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> any any really great meals that they've tested oh. that you've oh. got to enjoy? Yeah, I uh, it's the there was a uh, a Reuben sandwich pizza that came out of oh. the out of the cook kitchen just maybe a Hold week on. ago. A uh, Reuben sandwich pizza? Exactly, exactly. Right. Yep, yep. You have my attention. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. I gave him feedback. Could have been a little bit more sauerkraut and some more pickles in there. Um, the, the other ratio. one, okay. The other one, the other one, pad thai pizza. Pad thai pizza. Oh, yeah. You know, pad thai noodles. Imagine yeah. that on yeah. a pizza. So, can it pizza? You know, we have our, can, is it UPSable? The, the new phrase is, can it pizza? And so, pretty much that's, that's, that's the path they're running on nowadays today. Yeah. The verbs coming out of Blackstone. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, right. All right. Also related to overseas manufacturing, we mentioned at the top of the call that you speak Mandarin. When did you learn it and how has that been helpful for you working with overseas partners? Okay. So early in my college career at Brigham Young University, I had the chance to do a couple of years of voluntary religious service. And I got sent to Taiwan. And back then, I had to look Taiwan up on a map. I didn't know where it was. It's like my second home. And I spent two years there loving the food, loving the people, loving the culture. And it just, I just got hooked. And so I came back basically saying, okay, whatever I was going to study before, I'm going to combine it with Mandarin Chinese and Asian studies. And wow. from, from there, I did, I did those two years, then I came back and finished at BYU. Then I went down to a graduate school called Thunderbird down in Arizona and was able to do a semester abroad in Beijing. You mentioned studying in Beijing. So Beijing in 1988. So keep in mind, um, Tiananmen, the Tiananmen incident, that was the summer of 1989. I was there the summer of 1988. Very exciting time to be in China. Um, bicycles everywhere and probably one car for every 200,000 bicycles. It was a 
crazy time back then. Um, but yeah, since that point, yeah, I, my, I've been absolutely connected to Asia and specifically greater China. So throughout my career, ended up joining with General Motors, which is another big things company, right? I spent 12 years with yeah. General Motors, <laughs> several years in, in uh, Hong Kong, and then up in uh, this little community of called Tianjin up in northern China, this small town of 15 million people. And then, uh, yeah, and then a few years in Hong Kong, uh, uh, Shanghai as well. So all in maybe 20 years living in China, but just love it. And, and it really, it really is so useful to be able to meet, you know, the factories way more than halfway. Their English is great. No problem. But for example, I have no problem going down to the factory floor and saying, Hey, let me see that work instruction that you've got there. What does it tell you to do at this step? And I don't have to take anybody else's word for it. I can read it. I can talk to the operators. So it's really all in. It's been a great. A, a great boon to my my whole career, and I wouldn't be where I was today without that without that knowledge and experience. Oh, that's incredible! Um, any entertaining stories of your your trips when you look at the <laughs> yeah. manufacturing floors, or whether yes. it's Mandarin related yes. or not? I'm just curious. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So one about one about China, and then I'll talk about my one experience in India, which was okay. absolutely mind blowing for me. So China. China, from the early days onward, visiting factories, they were very um, hospitable, right? They wanted to be the best house possible. So they, your first visit, they would lay a spread out on the table. They would have fresh fruit and candies and, and pastries and whatever. And then they'd pay attention to what you ate, what you, what you took. And then the next time that you visited, there would be much more of that. Aww, well, That sounds I like traveled. my nana. She would do that too. <laughs> Yeah, it was great. You know, every factory had a, had a full fridge of Coke Zero. Well, oh. back in the day, it was Diet Coke. Yeah, so me was Diet Coke. This, That's I, your thing. One of the companies I worked with, yeah, the CFO, he did not like Chinese food. So he was always bringing his peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with him. So every factory would have peanut butter and jelly and bread for him. And they would bring that out and, you know, take care of him. They were always so very accommodating. Love it. Second story about India, first trip to India, first and only trip to India. I never went, I never got poked, inoculated, vaccinated so much when I went to China as when I went to India. And, they, and I had malaria pills and this kit for this and rabies and da-da. And so I was kind of hyped up to the point that I packed half of an entire suitcase full of ramen and granola bars thinking, okay, if I have to just go off grid and just survive on this, I can. Well, suffice it to say, I got picked up by our country manager. He swept us off to Agra, Taj Mahal. And from that point on, I didn't even, I didn't even open that suitcase. Every meal I ate was local, loved it, absolutely loved it. So it's kind of like that, you know, you, you build yourself up this mindset of, of anticipation and anxiety. And then you know, it's all for naught because it all works out in the end. I just find that there's people there that'll take care of you wherever you go in the world. And that's what I love about, about the work I've been involved in. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's great. All right, we're getting near the end. The one last question I want to ask is just career advice. What career advice would you give to someone entering supply chain? That's a great question. And, and I will say this about myself before I'll say about anybody else. I'm just a dumb ops guy, right? I come to the table and that's all I, that's all I bring to the table. <laughs> However, I will say this. Anyone can be at least a dumb ops guy and then some. And I would say supply chain is one of those agnostic fields where you bring whatever career background, whatever knowledge you have, whatever experience, book learning, whatever your education is, bring it. And it will, it will aid you in, in your work with supply chain, whether it's financial, marketing, um, any kind of technical knowledge that you have. And I see the whole gamut. And I, you know, my background was marketing with some, with some finance, but you, you know, I've been able to pick things up along the way. And I would just say that don't, don't think that because, oh, you've, you graduated in marketing, you can't get into supply chain operations because, Come one, come all. It's, it's, it's open to anyone and you bring whatever knowledge you have and you apply it and then you add to it. And no, maybe that's my mentality, but, and it's, and it's done well for me, but 
that's the way my career has gone. And so I would say that to anybody else thinking about the same thing on the other end of the career from me, from where I am right now. Except for those sales guys, right? You can leave the sales guys out. <laughs> no, 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 no. There's even, there's even a warm place in my heart for sales guys, Alex. Oh, man. Fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that, Tom. Let's move on to our, our speed round here. I'm going to hit you with some fun questions. And I'm going to start with what is uh, the best mountain to ski in Utah? Okay. So, first of all, let's just say the best snow is is utah snow it's incredible <laughs> it's 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 absolutely incredible snow this season and it's going to be one of those seasons where i put away my snow skis on the same way same weekend that i'm getting the wakeboard out to go out on the lake nice. yep. it's like you know the state of that water has changed from frozen to liquid and i'm now going to enjoy both so <laughs> yeah i i prefer there's a resort called snow basin that's located about mm. midway between logan and salt lake okay it's a great resort, got great variety, but yeah, I love, I love Snow Basin, but really, I mean, there's so many good places, so many good mountains, and everybody, all of them are having a great year this year. That's great. Great yeah. to hear. Are you watching anything good right now? Okay, so I am, been, I know I'm a little bit behind the curve, but I'm binge watching Better Call Saul. Okay. Right. I'm, huh. I'm in, I'm in third, third season of Better Call Saul. I'm binge watching that. I've gone through three seasons fairly quickly. And then a couple of other things that I'm, that I'm, I'm watching and listening to. One is a great podcast about the river of doubt. And I don't know if you guys know the history. 1914, Theodore Roosevelt and his son Kermit head off to, uh, to the Amazon. And there's this just discovered tributary literally called the river of doubt, the doubt river. And I forget how to say it in Portuguese, but he and a, and a team of explorers and naturalists, they trek 400 miles across the, the Amazon tundra to get to the headwaters. And then they float down this river and they're missing for months. Nobody knows where they are. So this is early 1914, right? Flash ahead a hundred years. The other thing that I'm watching is a documentary about MH370. And that, that went down what, March of 2014? So a hundred years apart, who would have thought you've got these two things that are going into the middle of nowhere and just disappearing? Now, Teddy Roosevelt, he eventually came out with his son, but you know, it's, it's really interesting to, to, to kind of compare and contrast. But yeah, a little bit of, I'm into nonfiction history. When I'm not doing supply chain stuff, that's when I'm when you're not doing in my su head. supply chain things or you're on a mountain <laughs> or in the water, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. All right, Tom. Well, last last question here is what did I not ask you that you want to talk about? The key is um with supply chain, you know, we've talked about paying attention to the small stuff. We've talked about the collaboration. We've talked about the importance of of everyone bringing their, the division of labor and specialization to the table. Um, one of the things, and, and I, and, and it's like a, you know, what's next for, for Blackstone products? You know, 2008 to, to probably the mid 2000 teens, we were surviving on maybe 30 SKUs. Mm -hmm. We now have, and that, and that got us late, late, I think it was 2018, 19, we broke into triple digit millions, right? Since that time, in the past four years, we've tripled sales, but we also have almost 1,200 SKUs today. Wow. So here's the idea, Alex. Think about this. And this, you know, both of you coming from where you're coming from, let's think about late point differentiation. Let's take a standardized basic griddle box, the, the, the burn box, as we call it, and we inventory that. That's one SKU. We also have we also have side shelves and hoods and front shelf and bottom panels and other accessories that you can add on to the point where from that one skew with a little bit of value add late point differentiation you can maybe create a hundred skews out of that right and I th I think I think you know we're we're just on the verge of starting to think about that kind of thing um, you know we have to get to the point where it becomes economically feasible to do that kind of value add somewhere closer to the to the market, but anywhere you can bring that, that final homologation as close to the end consumer as possible, that's when you really get good, good consumer satisfaction. So those are the things that's kind of the next chapter. You know, maybe we can get together in another year or so and see, okay, what have we done with, with that? 
Would and, love uh, that. you know, yeah, see where we are then. That's amazing. That's amazing, Tom. Well, thanks so much for, for coming on this episode and joining Michelle and I. And, and thanks for making great products. Um, people love it. So I can't wait mm-hmm. to get my hands on one. Great. Yeah, get in touch with me. I'll hook you up. <laughs> or at least I'll, I'll, I'll extol them as, as well as I possibly can from personal experience. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Alex, Michelle, thank you very much. Thank great you, to, great, great to be with you.